This is Michael Cowan, and welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. You've got to have the right case because if you take it up and it's the wrong case, then you can make some really bad law that's going to affect a lot of plaintiffs. There's always an answer. The joy is in finding. One of the reasons that I love being a lawyer is this exact process. The way we live our life has nothing to do with the presentation sequence at trial. As trial lawyers, we pick up and move on and keep going. You're losing or gaining one out of every 10 jurors, which can really make a huge difference in the ultimate result of the case. Whatever you think about, you create. Learn all you can and never stop. And then have the guts to try case after case after case. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Trial Lawyer Nation, your source to win bigger verdicts, get more cases, and manage your law firm. And now, here's your host, noteworthy author, sought-after speaker, and renowned trial lawyer, Michael Cowan. Welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. Uh, Today, Delisi Friday, our law firm's chief marketing officer, is joining us. And we're going to talk about uh, the leadership team we've created our firm uh, because it's made a remarkable difference in our practice. And I'm hoping that uh, some of it might be useful to you and the way you run your firm. How are you doing today, Delisi? I'm doing great. I'm really excited to be talking about this topic today. Yeah. So what is the leadership team? Um, Well, the leadership team for us consists of the three partners, our operations manager, and myself as the marketing director. And for each firm, that'll be different. But for us, that's who our leadership team consists of. And how long have we had a leadership team? That is a great question, Michael. I want to say, what, 2018 is when we started this? Because I feel like 2018, right before March of 2019, we we had been doing this. I can't remember if it was 18 or 19. I know it was, it, I know it was pre-pandemic. Mm-hmm. And I know that I'm glad we did the pre-pandemic because I don't know that we would have made it through the pandemic without the the work we had done uh, to try to have a healthier and more functional law firm uh, before right. the poop hit the fan. <laughs> yes. Um, but I feel like 2018 is is about right, if not maybe 2019. But we've been doing it um, for for a couple of years now. And in fairness, I should say this is not something we thought up ourselves. Uh, this is from one of the books uh, by an author named Patrick Lencioni, L-E-N-C-I-O-N-I. And if you listen to this podcast, you know that I am a total fan of Patrick Lencioni. Uh, and I don't I'm trying to remember which one of his books, but one of his books talked about creating a, a leadership team. Uh, it's probably Death by Meeting. Um, and we meet every Friday, except for today, because I'm speaking somewhere else tomorrow and today is a Thursday where we're recording so we're going to meet on Thursday instead of Friday this week but we meet every week um, and uh, talk about big things that uh, that affect our firm Uh, so tell us a little bit what's it like to be on a leadership team as a non-lawyer at a law firm that's a great question Um, I rather enjoy being a part of the leadership team. I think for anyone who is a young professional listening, there is a time in your career where you wonder where you get to that point where you get to have a seat at the table, as they say often, and be a part of decisions made. And I thoroughly enjoy being a part of that decision-making process and have really enjoyed to see the different parts of running a law firm and making decisions about the law firm that I didn't get to see before. I also think that being a part of the group, I get to add a different and unique dynamic to the conversations because obviously I look at things very differently than the partner or differently than our operations manager will. And I really think when you're coming up with discussions that are going to have a huge impact on your firm, Sometimes having those different opinions in the room really help make those decisions. And, and I have enjoyed being a part of the, the leadership team. Yeah, I've, I found it's interesting because law firms traditionally almost have a caste system. Either you're a lawyer or you're not a lawyer. And uh, we started out, well, of course, it started off, I just made decisions. Yeah. And then at some point, I brought Mallory and Sonia in and we would meet uh, I think we did like once a quarter, we would go, you know, somewhere outside of the office and meet for a day. But one thing we found out about, we realized when we started doing that is we often 
we're making decisions on incomplete and outdated information. For example, we 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 would be under the impression there was some some employee issue, and we would spend a couple hours talking about it. We would get a solution. We'd come back to meet with Teresa, only to find out she had resolved that issue three weeks before. Uh, and you know, so a lot of wasted time and effort, and 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 probably not the best decisions get made when you don't have complete information. But to do that, you need to get past this, you know, while legally in, I think, all but one state, only lawyers can have an ownership interest in a law firm, that only lawyers should be involved in managing a law firm. Because I I think that, one, you, you need to get good, accurate, timely information from people that are that have their, you know, the boots on the ground. The lawyers are off doing hearings and depositions, meeting with clients. So you don't always know what all's going on in the office. But two, you know, having a law degree is not training for running a business. Uh, in fact, most lawyers, and in my, including me, uh, historically, have been poor business managers and poor b- business people. And having uh, other voices and other brains in the room. Uh, I found has made us better. And so I would really encourage people, if you're thinking about creating a leadership team in, in your firm, uh, to include the non-lawyer leaders in your firm. Uh, you're going to get more buy-in, but you're also going to get better information uh, to make decisions. And you're going to get good ideas because uh, you know lawyers don't have a monopoly on good ideas. I also think another part of it is something we've talked about a lot on this podcast which is what you just mentioned a moment ago, having a law degree doesn't make you um, immediately a professional at running a business. And you're right. When you were mentioning we were making decisions and we didn't have the full um, story when we were doing these things, I, I absolutely love that you have myself and the operations manager in those conversations because you're right. Sometimes we do fix a problem. And the reason you have people in place in your office to do things is so you don't have to worry about all the little things. And having us in that conversation does help make it really clear what happened and has this been fixed? Is it still an issue? Is it not an issue? And then also give you a perspective of sometimes we talk with the employees and we'll have a perspective because we've been talking to different people in the office. So it does kind of add that other perspective in there on behalf of the staff in your office too. Absolutely. And and it it makes it easier for, you know, there's sometimes that, you know, let's say someone in the file room uh, or, you know, someone that helps you do intakes, they may feel comfortable telling you or Teresa or operations manager or something that they're just intimidated to tell the lawyers. Uh, but it's important information that we need to find out because, you know, uh, a lot of times people tell us, oh, no, everything's fine. Everything's fine. And then it's not fine. There's an issue that's frustrating them that could be fixed very easily, but they're too scared to tell us for whatever. I don't know why. I don't think I'm that scary, but evidently. I, <laughs> you are not scary, Michael Callen, but I will tell you, it is sometimes very intimidating to tell the person who signs your checks something that's <laughs> not always favorable. Yeah. It is. It, it just, that's the reality of it. So you are not intimidating, but it is difficult. And I will tell you now we'll talk about it in a moment. We have conflict in our meetings and we have to trust each other to have conflict. And that didn't happen overnight. It it had to take time for us to feel comfortable having those really tough conversations. And that's also another part of having a strong leadership team. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. So I want to talk a little bit about how we formed it and, and what we need to do. So, you know, if you're just having meetings and they're just meetings for everyone to agree with what Michael Cowan says, there's no point in having the meeting. Um, and so, you know, we had to create a team where we all have buy-in, we're all moving towards the same goals, and that we all trust each other enough to be able to give our opinions, even when we strongly disagree with things, because if we don't go and and let kind of the, I hate to say the word argument, but the debate happen, uh, so that we can see the 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 pluses and minuses of each side of an issue, we don't make the best decisions. But that takes a lot of, of trust uh, for people to be able to say, you know, Michael Cowan, I don't think that's a good idea, and here's why. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about how we built that. And I think we're 90% of the way there. I think there's still times when people hold back a little bit 
uh, with, with me, but I think 90%, we're 90% of the way there, which is a lot better than where we started. Uh, so we started with, uh, and again, we just took it from the book. We started with a uh, two-day retreat, just the five of us, uh, away from the office, and we answered, uh, I think it was six questions about the business. I think so, yeah. So why do we exist? Uh, what are our three core values? What do we do? How will we succeed? How yeah? How will we succeed? And and, and what's most important right now? I'm trying to make, make make sure I get them right. So what we did is we had a, a two day retreat and we answered certain questions. So why do we exist? What is the fundamental reason that we are at our law firm and that I have my law firm as opposed to just being at another law firm? You know, how do we behave? What are our core values? And and then Tony talks about having it three and really importantly having things that that we actually are right now not what we want to be but what are we what are the what are the core values there then what do we do just a real simple like because what we do means what we don't do like we litigate personal injury cases for plaintiffs and so when i've gotten opportunities for non-personal injury cases are for to say a case where you know it's a right a righteous defendant you know in a non non-insured you know, then unless we're going to change who we are and what we do, we don't take those cases. So it's made it a little easier to make decisions. You know, how will we succeed? What are our three strategies for success? You know, for us, it's to develop and support an elite team, which is the training and support for our law firm to attract the right cases, focusing on attorney referrals. We have good cases and we know that our business model will focus on attorney referrals and then to maximize the value of every case. And then what's our focus? And our focus was initially developing and supporting an elite team. Now we just originally changed to maximizing the value of every case, but that actually took two days to come up with all that. Yes. And, you know, when we went over that, I thought it would just be one day. I had no idea it would take us two days, but you're right. When you come up with this, it can't be things that you strive to be. It has to be what you really are. And that was an interesting discussion that we had amongst ourselves. Yeah, I think that's where we started. I think that's where people started feeling the permission to speak the truth uh, because we had to talk about, okay, some of these things like these are values we would like to have, but, you know, are we always excellent on every single case? Yeah. You know, do we always say no when we should say no? Uh, do we always, you know, hire the most elite person? You know, is that always true? If not, that can't be one of our core values. That could be what, what we call our aspirational values where we want to get there and this is our plan on how we're going to get there. But, you know, if you go and say, this is what we are, and your employer's like, that's a bunch of crap. We're not like that. Like if I said, you know, our core value was that I was going to be, you know, at my desk at 830 every morning. <laughs> you know, that's probably true 80% of the time, but it's not 100%. You know, it's just, right. does Michael take Aaron to school that morning or not? If he's not, he's going to sleep a little late. Uh, so Aaron's my 16-year-old son. Uh, so I think, you know, that was important. I think that was the, you know, trying to get that buy-in. But I think there still was, you know, we had come up with a lot of ideas and stuff before and not stuck with it. Uh, and I think there was probably a little bit of, a, you know, OK, we're going to go along with this, but, you know, let's not get our heart too set on it because who knows whether it's going to last more than a few weeks. Well, and I think the one thing that I've really enjoyed about us doing that is it also holds us accountable and it's something for us to continue to refer back to and stay focused on because every time we're doing something with regards to the law firm, we ask ourselves, does this match with what we have as a goal for our firm? Right. And it holds us accountable and it, it keeps us on track. And I've, I've really enjoyed that seeing that actually happen. Yeah. And it's, you know, we've been able to, to say, you know, does this align with our values you know, as far as making decisions? You know, like one of our core values is we fight hard without being a-holes. And so, you know, it's real easy. If if someone like the other side says, you know, can I get a two-week extension on something? Well, unless it's going to really hurt our case, the answer is, yeah, of course you can. The question is, hey, can you do me a favor and, you know, take, you know, instead of taking a million, can you take nine nine fifty on this case and do me a favor, maybe look with the adjuster? Our core value is maximize the value of our case. No, we can't. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, you go back to those core values and it helps you make those decisions. Um, and, uh, you know, I like that. Well, I was also going to say, yes, it also keeps us accountable, but it did start 
creating our leadership team on the right foot and making sure that we all agreed on the path and what we were doing and that created our bond. Yeah, the other thing we did is we figured we looked at how are we going to measure, you know, how we're doing as a firm. Um, and so I think we came up with financial reporting. Uh, so we do, you know, our on a weekly basis, our profit and loss, you know, fees, expenses, and then cash flow, what our case expenses are in and out, how much credit we have available, how much money each team at the firm has made in to see if everyone's, you know, doing their part. Uh, we look at marketing, we look at cases, you know, coming in and what kind of cases we have coming in. We look at uh, attorney caseloads because to maximize value of every case, we can't have too many cases per lawyer, but we also want to make sure we have enough. Uh, we look at office morale, uh, and then we look at IT issues, just because that's that's a constant in our firm, and I think most firms. Um, and so, you know, before we we don't have an agenda, so we meet every Friday, and that's been so important to meet weekly. Uh, and because I don't think if you know if we let weeks and weeks go by without meeting, this thing's all going to fall apart. Uh, and so we we make ourselves meet weekly. We just set it at a certain time every week, and just. You know, 90% of the time, the lawyers can keep their schedules clear on Friday afternoons. Um, and before we decide what we're going to talk about, instead of having to set agenda, uh, we go through those five metrics. So I give, you know, I have bookkeeping. I give a financial report. Uh, you give the marketing and the attorney case load report or operations manager. Oh, systems compliance. I forgot that one. It gives us a systems compliance report, which is, you know, how many people are, we have certain metrics, you know, doing your file reviews, uh, turning in certain reports 90 days before expert deadline and uh, 90 days for trial and making sure we're calling our clients on a regular basis. You know, so how many people are doing that or not doing that? And then a general discussion of report on office morale and whether there's any IT issues. And then we kind of rate each one, you know, green, which is we're doing great, was wonderful, better than expected. Yellow, it's like, okay, hey, we're doing okay. And red is we've got a problem. Uh, and then we, we kind of allow ourselves to kind of use an orange or a light green for the kind of in-betweens. Um, and then we come up with, we each can list one to three things we want to talk about. And I think that's important so that the meetings become, we spend our time on, th on what really matters that week instead of on just having a fixed agenda. And, and I will tell you, as someone who loves structure, that was hard for me at the beginning, not having an agenda and going in and not knowing what we were going to talk about that meeting. Sure, I prepare my marketing. I will run the attorney caseload report and I'll have that, but um, not having an agenda was hard for me. But once we started to do this and we decided what topics we were going to talk about after we discussed those different metrics, it made sense because sometimes I think we need to talk about something and I'm going to bring it up as my topics. But once I see, oh man, IT is red or, you know, systems compliance is orange, then I think that my, that other topic can wait. It's not necessary right now. Let's talk about what matters right now. And that's really helpful in having discussions that matter at a, in a timely fashion. Right. Because we want a one, you know, a one hour to hour and a half meeting every Friday. We can't spend all day talking about every little thing of the firm. And then, you know, mm -hmm. deciding what people can, you know, I think we're still working on what is something you should just talk to me about? What is something you should decide on your own? And what's something that merits the entire leadership team's involvement? Because, you know, it's, leadership team should be talking about things that, that really are going to affect the whole firm, big things that are, are where people just need the the guidance of the group. And, you know, I think we still sometimes get a little, you know, too involved on, well, what hotel are we going to get for the firm retreat and stuff like that? That really is probably something we should learn to okay, we're going to have a firm retreat in this city. Teresa, here's your budget. Go with it, you know. But right. we're, we're, we're moving in the right direction. It's a, it's a work in progress. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and commercial vehicle cases. If you have an injury case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us. You can reach Delisi Friday by calling 210-941-1301 or send an email to delisi at cowanlaw.com. That's D-E-L-I-S-I at cowanlaw.com. She will coordinate a time for Michael Cowan to speak with you in person or by phone to discuss the case in detail and see where we can add value in a partnership. And now, back to the show. And so... I guess two of the things that Lynchoni talks about is one is 
what he calls vulnerability-based trust. So not trust that I trust you're going to do what you say, which is important, but trust in that I trust that you and I, I trust that you will believe that I have our team's best interest at heart, that I care about you, and that if I say something that is go- going to be critical of you or that disagrees with you, that you will accept that as coming from a good place rather than trying to put you down. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is hard to yeah. develop. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's really hard. I will tell you, I am a, I, I take things really personally. So that is hard for me to do. You have to be just in the right mindset to hear something and not take it personal. But when you have these meetings over and over again, and you're discussing this in a business setting, and you're talking about it from a business perspective, it helps to take that personal aspect out of it. But we're also human. So sometimes it's hard not to take things personal, but it absolutely takes time. I, and I agree, we're not there yet, but we've we've made some big strides in the right direction. I think never taking it personal can't be the goal because we're always going to be human. We're always going to have emotions. But what happens is that when the discussion is over and you have 15 minutes to let it rest, you're okay with, well, I, I'm. we may not have made the decision I agreed with or that I wanted to make, but I've been hurt. Mm-hmm. And I, I think if people, because sometimes we don't all agree, and then I have to make the decision. And sometimes I make a decision, and I'm the only one. I mean, all four of you were against it. <laughs> and um, but I think the the theory, and I think it's working, is that if people know that they were heard uh, and considered and respected, they're more likely to buy into the to the decision. And 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 most decisions are made by consensus. I mean, I think ninety percent right. of the time, once we talk through an issue that we are absolutely all in agreement, but there's other things that I'll just give one, a vaccine mandate at the firm. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had passionate, uh, but I think respectful discussion. We don't all agree, uh, but I made the decision that no, I I don't believe that I as an employer have the right to mandate medical decisions for people. Uh, and some people agree with it. Some people didn't, but we're all living with it. And no one's, we're not, no one's bringing it up again because it's the decision has been made. Um, uh, and you know, that's one of the, one of the biggest ones because of the, you get emotional, you get political, you can get tribal. And that could be something that could really, you know, tear at a firm if you didn't have something where everyone could feel like, okay, we've all been heard and now we've made the discussions, you know? So absolutely there, you know, I actually listened to Lynchoni's podcast last night and the one I listened to was discussing that. And it's a very heated topic and people can get very upset. But I think one of the things I'm really proud of with our leadership team is we do all trust each other and we are comfortable having uncomfortable conversations. And that's a beautiful thing to see in a business. And I think it also makes us a healthy business. And another part of the Lynchoni book that helped us create our leadership team was talking about Yes, we will not always agree on everything, but if you give everyone an opportunity to voice their opinion, when you make the decision at the end, you leave the room saying, I said my piece, maybe it's not what I wanted, but that's a decision we made and you're okay with it because you've shared your opinion and it was heard. And I think that's also an important part of it is making sure if you are going to disagree on something, as long as everyone is heard as you're, and you're respectful, then you still leave the room feeling okay about the conversation that was had and it it doesn't come from a bad place. Yeah. And I think, you know, early on, I think I really had to encourage disagreement, if that makes any sense, you know, try to yeah. say, you know, <laughs> look around the room and try to read facial expressions or body language and say, you know, Sonia, I don't know. I'm, I'm getting a sense you don't agree with that. What's, what's, what do you think? Uh, because at first there was a more of a, let's so from Sonia, because Sonia is very much. Sonia very vocal. She's, <laughs> and, uh, and she's also my natural antagonist. She's the, I, I'm the one that gets crazy ideas and just wants to run with them. Don't think, let's just go. And Sonia is the one that says, Michael, that's a bad idea. What about yeah. this? And so then that's kind of our natural roles on the team. Yeah. Uh, but. I think for, and I think she provided a good model that she could totally disagree with me on something and we could, you know, debate back and forth and then be, go have lunch afterwards and be fine and nothing bad happened to her. And people said, well, I can do that too. 
But you did a great job because you're right. When you create a leadership team, it does take time to get to that point. So you as a leader do have to find that body language or that one person who's not saying anything. And, you know, it's kind of like war dire. You're number (laughs) seven. I haven't heard from you. How do you feel? (laughs) You know, Um, that you have to apply that here in your leadership team as well. So you did a great job of that. And I think that's really important too, because um, you don't have that healthy conflict in the beginning and it does take time. And it's interesting. You said Sonia is like our natural antagonist. I think we all kind of have these roles in our leadership team, but what was interesting and it just showed that we were having growth from within is there was an annual meeting we had where Sonia said, Delisi, I want to tell you, I feel bad sometimes saying things because I don't want to hurt your feelings because for the podcast listeners, Sonia has known me since I was a kid because my father is also an attorney and she's friends with him. So she's known me since I was little. So there's that little aspect of her saying something where she doesn't want to hurt me because she cares about me and she's known me for so long, but you have to trust each other to say things and not take it personal. And we had to work through it and we did. So it's important to get that out there and let it, let it breathe. And, and eventually you work it all out, but um, it's been a journey for us. It has been. And I think we're really getting there. And, you know, the, the good thing is when we get enough of a trust relationship where we can have an uncomfortable conversation with each other, because I I am not someone that naturally has uncomfortable conversations. I mean, the, I don't come from a family where we have uncomfortable conversations. I come from a family where we pretend like things aren't there and then we blow up each other and then we pretend like it never happened. And, and I grew up with, you know, if you start an uncomfortable conversation, you're either going to get you know, blown off or you're going to get yelled at. There's not going to be a, you know, it's just not something we do. We do well. Uh, we do better now. Our family, our families also become healthier over time, but growing up, that just wasn't something that I learned how to do. Uh, and I found when I was able to have uncomfortable conversations in this kind of group where I trusted people and then nothing bad happened and, you know, people didn't leave the firm or get all, you know, been out of shape and, uh, but that it actually made things better. Then it became easier for me to have uncomfortable conversations with other people at the firm. It became actually easier for me to have uncomfortable conversations with my wife and with my son. And, you know, it's just, uh, it's a skill that we have to yeah. develop like anything else. And, uh, and it's a skill that that really uh, pays dividends. And, you know, I found that it's so important to be transparent and to be honest with people when we when something's bothering us, especially with employees or coworkers, and we don't bring it up and it festers. Yeah. Well, one, you know, if, if they don't know what's bothering you, then they think they're doing just fine. And then two, it allows things to get so out of hand that by the time you address them, they can't be fixed anymore. And by having that conversation early, we're, uh, we are able to, uh, to fix things. I I I will, I will say, you know, part of what was the toughest for me as the business owner was sharing financials. Um, and I even gave you all copies <laughs> now, <I know. laughs> uh, and not just show them, uh, but showing the you know, the because at one hand you're right. Well, if I sell someone how much money we're making and we're doing having a good year, everyone's going to want more. And then what's going to happen when we have a bad year, or, or you know what, what's going to be left for me? And then when things are bad, you know, because there's always ups and downs in any business, and even from month, even like on our best years, we still have months where we're not profitable because we're a contingent fee firm and things come in chunks. Uh, you know, is everyone going to panic? Is everyone going to want to leave because things aren't looking so good? You know, I've been doing this long enough. I know it's going to come around, but well, other people, and then there's the embarrassment of I'm supposed to be this big badass lawyer. How can I have a bad quarter or a bad month or a bad year? Uh, and so, you know, and I've had other lawyers to me, never share, never share the financials, just pay people what you're going to pay them and don't ever let them know what's going on. Uh, and it was scary. Uh, and it was scary to share, you know, the, the big challenges, the bad news stuff. Uh, but no one ate me up. No one went and quit. No one, you know, it, it, it is actually really, the transparency has worked really well, I think. You know, you mentioned a lot of people telling you not to do that and not to share that information. So for the people listening who have heard that, what advice do you have for them? Well, I, I still would not, uh, I still would not publish our financials to the entire firm. Um, I do think there there is 
there is a level of trust you need to get before you share that kind of proprietary information. Um, and there are people out there and, uh, that, you know, if they see you're making anything, they think they should make it or, you know, uh, and, uh, same for what people are, you know, what different people are making. I mean, I don't know that that's healthy thing to share outside of a leadership team, what each person makes and stuff. But I think if you're going to have a team that's going to be making business decisions, they have to have some financial information. And if it's funny, cause we talk about all this stuff and, but then if you go to like publicly traded companies, where everybody's in a room, everybody knows what the company's making. Everyone knows what each other are making because it's being publicly reported. They're able to do things and they don't seem to have a problem with it. You know, I don't know why we, I think a lot of it's in my own head and it's my relationship with money and feeling guilty and about making money or feeling like I'm not going to have enough and something bad's going to happen. Whatever those feelings are, are being projected more than it's actually a problem. I don't think that people at my firm actually have a problem with me making money. <laughs> I don't think we do either. You, you earn it. Um, Was there a point where there was almost like this relief because you were sharing it? Was it helpful in, in relieving some of that pressure of being the person who's always in charge of having that information? Yes. Uh, There were a a couple of points where we had, you know, challenging times. I think uh, the COVID, the COVID times, uh, the beginning of this year where I, you know, I knew that when trials were starting, cases were going to start popping again, but, uh, but being able to share that burden uh, and uh, although it was still scary because I'd done this long enough where I knew things were going to be just fine, but, you know, we had borrowed a couple million dollars, literally a couple million dollars so that we didn't have to lay anybody off and, you know, so we could make payroll and, uh you know, keep everything in fun cases and keep everything going while none of the big cases were settling due to the lack of COVID trials, you know, and it, and it all turned around this year, but I knew it would, but it was, uh, it was scary to share that news, but at the same time, it felt nice to have someone to share it with and to have a team to all make a plan. But I do think I did cause uh, some people to have, some people were feeling stressed, although they may have been feeling stressed anyway, if they didn't know. So I don't know whether them knowing or not knowing helped. Well, I will say it, you're right. It definitely helps when you're making business decisions to have that information. Because when we look at financials at the beginning of every morning and we're having conversations about the business, sometimes it's really imperative for us to have that information when we're trying to decide what to do because we are a contingency fee based firm. So there are often times when decisions we make have to be Keeping in mind, we have X amount of money in the bank. We have X amount of money out. We have X amount of money in case expense. Like there's so much that we discuss in making those decisions that it absolutely helps us make the best decisions when we have all of the information. Yeah. Enjoying the episode? Do you wish you had Trial Lawyer Nation on the go? Well, wish no more. The Trial Lawyer Nation app is available now exclusively on iOS devices. Access our entire podcast library, create a favorites list, search for old and new episodes, and much more. It truly is Trial Lawyer Nation at your fingertips. Download this free app now and enjoy the top legal podcast for plaintiff attorneys wherever you go. I will also say one of the things that we started doing in the middle of this year that we didn't do before and I think has been extremely helpful to us was when in our leadership meetings, when we were discussing financials, we also discussed how each team was doing financially as well. That I think has made a a great change in our conversations and also assessing how our firm is doing. It's not something that we did last year and I'm really enjoying having that information and discussing it regularly because I think it helps us keep the health of the firm in mind when we're having discussions and see, well, what do we need to do? What's going to happen? What's possible? And decide what we can do to help along the way. Absolutely. And it also has gotten me the, you know, we tried for a while uh, sharing on a weekly attorney meeting, sharing what each lawyer had brought in in fees. And uh, the immediate effect of that was good because it created some pressure on people that were at the bottom of the list uh, to work a little harder and to get some cases closed and to realize that, you know, their performance was not, uh, you know, was way out of line because we had a couple people that were like 
you know, 10% of what other people were bringing in. Uh, but in the long term, and maybe it's because of the group of people we had, maybe it would be different if we did it now. Uh, but it created some real jealousy because uh, not all DACAs are equal. And, you know, uh, when you have like a long term high performer like Mallory and you get like a really big case in, you're going to be more likely to give that case to a Mallory or a Sonia because they've earned the trust rather than somebody who's newer. They're, not that they're not good lawyers, but it's like, my best cases go to my best lawyers. And if you want to get one of those, then work your way up. And, you know, and then we, and we have lawyers who are making great progress and a great job, but it's still not a truly equal, you know, allocation of cases. And so I found that it created some, some issues that way. And so, but what I have done is where I finally, and maybe it was my own courage. I, I'm giving people kind of, this is what you need to bring in every year to break even. This is what you need to have a good year. This is what you've done so far. This is what you've done on a rolling 12 months basis, basically. And so let's say it's November 1st. So let's look at, you know, November 1st of last year till October 31st of this year, because that's the fair way to look at a, at a contingent fee firm, because the, you know, you have all the ups and downs. So if we're looking at like June uh, and we're only looking at the first six months, well, you know, that's not as as accurate of a measurement as just looking at what have you brought in the last 12 months. But we look at both because people's bonuses are based on the year and what they bring in a calendar year. Um, and I think, you know, it's been a really good thing to share that information because I think it's got some people they don't realize um, that where they need to be or that they are behind because they're just sitting there working and they're not keeping track of it. Absolutely. And I also think, you know, lawyers are competitive. Well, the best lawyers are competitive. <laughs> And so I think sharing that information is really important for them. Um, and also it helps with transparency because the lawyers are working on their cases and they're bringing money in, but they don't have the conversations like we do about, well, how much does it cost to actually run the firm? So they don't realize what is profitable for them. They might just think profitable for them is making more than what we pay them, but it's not. And so helping them see the bigger picture and what is profitable, I think, has been really critical in making sure that they understand what they're doing and when they do become profitable. And lawyers need goals. The only way they're going to reach their goals is if you tell them what their goal is so they can do it and check in with them and help them along the way so they know where they're at. But I think that's been really important for us. Yeah. And what I find is some lawyers are more motivated by goals than money. And so, you know, I thought by putting people on a, on a system where, you know, if you, once you exceed a certain threshold, you get a certain percentage of what you bring in. Um, but some people, it's like, if their base is high enough, that it's like, well, I'm making enough money. I'm not really worried about that. That's not, that's not going to motivate me. But when you give them a goal and like, you know, to pass, you need to make this grade, basically, you need to bring in this much money, then they get motivated to meeting the goal. It's kind of weird. Right. Because uh, I would be, you know, very much motivated but i mean when i was last working for someone else i even like gave up my base just to like give me a better percentage and you don't have to pay me a base and right. uh just was very motivated by it. but not everybody is motivated by money or they are motivated by money but they have a number in their mind of what good money is and then once they get that that no longer motivates them so you have to find a different motivation absolutely so what advice would you give then to someone who wants to you know they have a firm first of all how big a firm do you think you need to be to, to make it worth having a leadership team I, I don't think there is a, a firm that's too small that doesn't need a leadership team. And that might shock some people, but I think even a firm that just has, you know, six employees is still a firm that needs a leadership team. And maybe it's not as large as ours. Maybe it's just the firm owner and the accounting manager or whoever else you have in place um, that helps make important decisions with your firm. Maybe that's your leadership team. But I absolutely think everyone should have some kind of a leadership team in discussing things like this. And for those that have a firm that's even smaller than that, then I don't think it would be, I think it would be a great idea for someone to then say, let me reach out to someone else and have these discussions. So if you're not large enough to have a leadership team, maybe you need to have a quarterly meeting with your CPA and talk about financials in that aspect. Or maybe you need to reach out to a mentor yeah. and say, hey, once a quarter, can we meet and just go over some things that I have going on at my firm? Because the only way you improve is when you look at what you're doing and think of the areas where you need to improve, set a goal, and then reach it. But 
if you're not talking about it with someone else, then you're strictly hoping that you help yourself get there along the way. And I think you need a team of people, whether it's internal or a mentor, or again, just talking to your CPA to reach those goals. So I think everyone should have a leadership team. And if you can't have an internal, then figure out who that person is. But I think as business owners, we have to, we need to talk these things out and address them and hold ourselves accountable and do it regularly. I, I agree. And uh, I think even if you're like a four lawyer firm or four, not, not four lawyer, four employee firm, you can still have two, like at least one trusted person, if not two, I think three, you get better. There's something about the dynamics of threes, mm-hmm. three yeah. or more. You don't want it too big. You don't want more than five or six people because then it just gets too big to have real discussions. But uh, I think just having something where you're sharing, you're talking things through, you're sharing ideas and trying to get to the best decisions. And you're also getting input about what else is going on at your firm. Because we don't always know and people don't always tell us. Right. I agree. Yeah. And and for those people who don't have a leadership team that's as large as ours, then maybe your meetings look a little bit different. We talked about all the things we discuss in our weekly meetings. Well, if not all of those apply to your firm, then don't talk about all of them. Come up with what your top two or your top three are and discuss it with that other person. And if that other person doesn't have that trust that we've worked on and we've created and we have right now, then start small and then work your way up. Because like you mentioned, it was not easy for you to share all of this information with us right away. And it it did take a little bit of time before you got comfortable with it. So understand that maybe that's how it is for you in the beginning. Maybe it's going to take a little bit of time before you feel comfortable sharing some of this information with whoever your leadership team is when you start it. Yeah, the other thing, you know, the other thing is, you know, the the book The Advantage by Patrick Manchoni is kind of he's got lots of books with the theory. It's kind of like the step by step guide of how to do this. It's cheap. If you're gonna think about doing this, get it. I mean, some people hire consultants and stuff. I've I've had mixed results with consultants. I've learned something from each of them, but they're all always a reason that they're consulting and not actually running a business too. Um but uh I find that if you just you know read the book and follow the method, it will it will improve your firm. So I encourage everybody, you know, we spend more time with our work families than we do with our own families. Let's try to make this the healthiest, happiest family and most pleasant environment we can do. uh, And so that we can actually prosper, do great work for our clients and have fulfilling lives. So well said. With those modest goals, I look forward (laughs) I look forward to uh, everyone. I hope everyone has a great day. And I look forward to our next episode of Trial Lawyer Nation. Thank you for joining us on Trial Lawyer Nation. I hope you enjoyed our show. If you'd like to receive updates, insider information, and more from Trial Lawyer Nation, sign up for our mailing list at triallawyernation.com. You can also visit our episodes page on the website for show notes and direct links to any resources in this or any past episode. To help more attorneys find our podcast, please like, share, and subscribe to our podcast on any of our social media outlets. If you'd like access to exclusive, plaintiff lawyer-only content and live monthly discussions with me, send a request to join the Trial Lawyer Nation Insider Circle Facebook group. Thanks again for tuning in. I look forward to having you with us next time on Trial Lawyer Nation. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and commercial vehicle cases. If you have an injury case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us. You can reach Delisi Friday by calling 210-941-1301 or send an email to delisi at cowanlaw.com. That's D-E-L-I-S-I at cowanlaw.com. She will coordinate a time for Michael Cowan to speak with you in person or by phone to discuss the case in detail and see where we can add value in a partnership. This podcast has been hosted by Michael Cowan and is not intended to, nor does it create the attorney-client privilege between our host, guest, and any listener for any reason. Content from the podcast is not to be interpreted as legal advice. All thoughts and opinions expressed herein are only those from which they came.